our sample data can be plagued by bias, but even if we take all the appropriate measures to minimize that as much as possible, or even potentially eliminate it altogether, then our sample data, our sample results, still have the potential for error. And this error comes from simply error due to chance. In example two, we want to flip a fair coin 10 times and use this to estimate the probability of getting tails. So we know that every time we flip a coin, we have a 50-50 chance of getting heads or tails. So if we flip a coin 10 times, we should get tails five times. But simply due to chance, sometimes we end up getting tails a little more, a little less. So rather than flipping a coin, what I've done is set up this Excel spreadsheet to simulate that for us. So each of these cells is going to return a value of either 0 or 1, where 0 represents heads, 1 represents tails, and then it's going to calculate the probability for us. So I can rerun this. Our numbers change each time. So actually in this case, when I ran this, we ended up with a probability of exactly 50%. So we flipped a coin 10 times, and we got tails half the time. So we nailed that population proportion exactly. But if we run this experiment again and generate a new list of values between either zeros or ones, we get a proportion of 60%, 50% again, 50%. This actually, this round is actually going pretty well, 60%. And usually if we do this enough times there, we start to see this drop a little bit. So we were getting around 50 or 60% tails. Now this time we came up with just 40% tails. So if we run this experiment again, this time we only got 20% tails. So this is getting better. I was worried that we were going to get 50% every time. So just randomly due to chance, we don't always get that exact 50-50 proportion that we're looking at. In this case, we flipped our coin 10 times, and only twice did we get, a ta get tails. So that's the phenomenon we're talking about when we talk about error due to chance. So we're trying to estimate the probability of getting tails. We know that that actual population proportion, P, should be 0 0.5. But when we run our experiment, we got values of P hat, so our sample proportion, equal to 0 0.6, P hat equal to 0 0.4, and we got as low as P hat equal to 0 0.2. And there were a couple of times, quite a few times, that we actually got that 50% exactly. So whenever we conduct a study, whenever we conduct a sample, then we're going to end up with values that sometimes get that population parameter exactly right, other times are very close, and sometimes are farther away. So we can always calculate the error in our sample measurement by taking the sample statistic, which in this case is p hat, minus that known true population parameter. So in this case, the error for a po um, sample proportion of 0.6 would be 0.1, because the difference between that and our population parameter is 0.1. So our sample results may not match the true population parameter. So in order to compensate for that, what we're going to do is stretch what we call our point estimate. So our point estimate is just our sample statistic that we came up with. But instead of referring specifically to our sample proportion, this will apply for the sample mean, sample median, whatever statistic we're collecting. So we're going to stretch that point estimate into a range of values. So if we look again at this number line, we know 0 0.5 should be that true population proportion that we're trying to capture. Based off our sample statistic, whatever that ends up being, we're going to stretch it to be a little bit larger and a little bit smaller. So we're going to stretch it an equal, direct, equal distance in both directions. 
and hope that this interval we come up with, this range of values, now includes that sample statistic that we're after. So depending on where our sample statistic falls, we may or may not capture that actual population proportion. So in our example above, we came up with a p hat of 0.2 or 20%. If we came up with a p hat of say 80%, took this sample statistic or this point estimate and stretched it into that same range of values, so the same distance as this one, it fails to capture that true population proportion. So when we talk about stretching that point estimate, we get this range of values, which we refer to as a confidence interval. So, and we get that by adding and subtracting a margin of error from our point estimate. So it's a little bit different than the error we talked about up here, but a margin of error will be calculated, subtracted, added and subtracted from our point estimate to give us this range of values. But we have this problem that sometimes that confidence interval still fails to capture the actual population parameter. In example three, we want to simulate this experiment that we just ran in example two, but we want to do it a hundred different times. So rather than looking at that spreadsheet over and over again, StatCrunch is going to give us a way to do this. And let me get logged in here. So StatCrunch has some different interactive tools built into it under this applets menu. So we're going to look at confidence intervals for a proportion. We're going to simulate a scenario where the actual population proportion is 50%, so that's what it would be for flipping a coin, and we're going to click Compute. So what StatCrunch has just done here is generated a hundred different experiments where a sample value was collected and then again stretched into that range of values, so each of these horizontal bars represents that confidence interval and at the middle of that interval is our point estimate. So these green bars represent that stretched value, that range of values. Every time that bar occurs in green, that means our confidence interval successfully captured this true population proportion of 50%. And everywhere we get a red bar, we have a confidence interval that failed to capture that. So what we can see in this case is that 97% of the time, our confidence intervals successfully captured that true population proportion, which means 3% of the time, these three red bars failed to capture that. This confidence interval level, CI level, is a value that we can set to help control how often we want this process to be successful. So we could go back and we could lower that confidence level. Say let's make it something quite a bit smaller, like 80%. And now we're going to see a lot more red bars, a lot more confidence intervals, ranges of values that failed to capture that true population proportion. But we still have about 81% of the time confidence intervals that do cap capture that true population proportion. So along with our confidence intervals, when we construct those, we can set a confidence level to tell us about the success rate of this process of repeating an experiment over and over and over again and how often that will capture the true value that we're after. So we can assign that confidence level and that confidence level is going to tell us about the percentage of times our interval will capture the true parameter whenever that experiment is repeated over and over and over and over again. 